Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Frank Hearn. I've been around this ship for getting on close to 12 years now, I guess. Uh, and you can see from the heading on the briefing paper that I, I passed out to you all that uh, I wrote this thing back in 2000. So when I said 56 years ago in the first paragraph, it's 56 plus 9. <laughs> it's getting longer and longer and harder and harder to remember. Uh, the purpose of this class is, is to uh, give docents some background uh, uh, to respond to visitors, uh, often ask questions about, well, how did pilots navigate over the open seas in the old days uh, without GPS? Uh, everybody, everybody knows what GPS is, but very few people know what dead reckoning is. And dead reckoning is a term that applied to the uh, system of navigation that we used back then. Uh, the briefing is not intended as a course in navigation. I couldn't possibly teach you this in an hour, but I can give you enough of a background maybe to weigh your appetite to look into it a little bit more. The, uh, <clears throat> the operational and techno technological constraints of now 65 years ago uh, were considerably different than they are today. Uh, today we're uh, uh, airplane cockpits are full of magic black boxes and all kinds of uh, things that enable the pilot to uh, uh, to navigate uh, uh, generally with by push button rather than by having to sit down and plot courses and uh, uh, calculate ground speeds and uh, take into account uh, uh, wind velocities at altitude and so on. Uh, those black boxes are generally go by names that you're probably all familiar with, GPS, the Global Positioning System, TACAN, uh, with its distance measuring capability and uh, uh, various other devices that uh, we just simply didn't have access to. Uh, more importantly, uh, perhaps what we didn't have back then was an adequate radio communication system. Uh, we had one but uh, we couldn't use it. Uh, we were uh, uh, deathly afraid of, uh, of the enemy find using a direction finder on our signals, uh, locating either us or our track, which would give them an indication of where the ship was that we came from. Uh, and so therefore the, the uh, the transmissions that we were limited to uh, as pilots was uh, uh, were twofold. One was a significant enemy sighting, uh, and perhaps the the most classic of all of those was the was the uh, PBY pilot uh, just off of Oahu shortly after Pearl Harbor who sent back the signal, sighted sub sank the same latitude so-and-so, longitude so-and-so, and that was the end of it. Uh, and you didn't uh, expect a reply because the ship uh, or the shore was not going to give it to you. Uh, you just sent the message in the blind. The second one was that if you were on an attack mission instead of a search mission, uh, you were to give a, a signal of a, a, what was called a strike signal. Uh, letting anybody who was listening know that you were uh, you were going in on the target. A, uh, <clears throat> there were frequently some unexpected things that occurred along the way and you had to be prepared to adjust your flight plan for that. Uh, the flight plan itself was something that was developed in the ready room prior to the prior to the mission. Uh, the uh, uh, the squadron leader or the or the air group commander, depending upon how big the assembly was, would uh, uh, would spell out the parameters of the mission, and uh, uh, the pilots would use that information in preparing their their rather detailed flight plans. Uh, before about July of 1944. Uh, the standard attack carrier was at, at that time called a fast carrier. 
carried an air group consisting uh, usually, typically, of three squadrons, uh, a fighter squadron, a bombing squadron, and a torpedo squadron. Uh, and after July 44, this complement was sometimes increased to four squadrons uh, by adding aircraft especially uh, outfitted for a particular task, including uh, uh, night, night flying, which we did not do ordinarily prior to that time. At first, uh, each squadron was nominally, uh, nominally consisted of 12 aircraft. Uh, but sometimes increased for a specific mission. Early in 1942, there was an apparent objective to maintain a one-to-one -one ratio of replacement aircraft aboard each carrier. So when you, as you have read in some of the other material about, well, how many airplanes did you carry on this thing? When you talk about somewhere from 85 to 100, uh, remember that half of those were generally replacement aircraft and most of them were suspended from the overhead down on the hangar bay and had to be sometimes even had to be assembled before they could be used. Uh, the air group commander or the uh, CAG usually held the rank of commander. The squadron leaders were typically lieutenant commanders and the squadron pilots ranged from ensigns to senior grade lieutenants with sometimes uh, a naval, uh, naval flight officer or a naval, naval pilot officer, NPOs, uh, who were actually uh, petty officers. The uh, multi-place bombers and torpedo bombers carried air crews of one or more radio and gunners as well as the pilot. Missions were usually classed as attack missions or scouting slash search missions. In order to extend the range of the scouting missions, the planes ordinarily carried only defensive ordnance instead of the heavier load of attack hardware. In the days before night searches, most scouting missions were carried out by fighters and, uh, and uh, scout or dive bombers. Uh, missions were generally ordered by the battle group or task force commander a flag officer who, with the support of his tactical staff, developed and transmitted an outline of the missions to the carrier skippers. The captain convened a meeting of the CAG, the air officer, the air boss, as we call them, uh, the CIC officer, the navigator, the aerographer, and other essential specialties to detail the mission. The CAG then met with the squadron leaders to assign appropriate elements uh, to the mission and its uh, parameters such as launch and departure time, boundaries of the flights, mission objectives, radio frequencies to be used, and coordination of the different types of aircraft aboard. The squadron leaders issued briefing orders to their pilots who had assembled in their respective ready rooms to receive detailed flight assignments, and each squadron leader was assisted in these briefings by appropriate specialists in weather intelligence, ship's navigation during the mission, and communications. Communications uh, were pretty limited, as I said. The um, search missions for, from the carriers were of, of generally two types. Uh, the broad sector search in which a large area of ocean was to be searched uh, for signs of the enemy shipping uh, or searches that were confined to an area in which enemy shipping had been specifically reported. <clears throat> These had the same navigational considerations as the broader searches, uh, meaning those that uh, were what in later years called search and destroy missions, uh, because the carrier was not likely to be in the same place on the pilot's return leg that it was when he departed. <clears throat> Attack missions were usually launched toward a specific set of geographic coordinates where enemy shipping or shore installations had been positively identified. Another type of search called a geographic search was used when planes were deporting or and or returning to, to a fixed base on land. Uh, that didn't happen very often in the Navy, but uh, one, once some of the bear bases were established down in the Southwest Pacific, it did. And the pilots then were able to return to a base that they, they knew where it was.
that type of mission, of course, usually eliminated the navigational problem of calculating relative motion, relative motion being the, the relationship between the movement of the airplane and the movement of sh the ship at the same time. <clears throat> In uh, sector searches, uh, uh, adjacent segments of the circle radiating out from the carrier were assigned to each flight. Uh, the number of segments to be searched was dependent on the number of aircraft available. These are wedge-shaped areas usually, which usually became trapezoidal in shape due to the movement of the carrier during the several hours of the search. The carrier is moving all the time, and uh, uh, so the pilot goes out, and, and uh, what would ordinarily be a uh, pie wedge, uh, the, the return leg is uh, uh, adjusted uh, to be able to intercept the carrier at the time that the plane was, and the carrier were going to arrive at the same spot. Frank? Yeah. What, uh, once a squadron launched, did the carrier always endeavor to, to follow a fixed course so that it would be at a known position? Well, they, they tried to, but as you can imagine, that wasn't always that. possible. Yeah. They frequently, uh, and, and lots of times in the, in the briefing, uh, the zigzag plan would be announced uh, so that they would have some idea. However, the, the zigzag usually didn't have much of an effect on, on trying to find the, the carrier. The base, the base course would be the same. Yeah, the pretty, pretty much, yeah. They were supposed to arrive at the same point right. okay. at a time specific. Uh, because it may contain virtually all the navigational problems encountered, the plotting solution used in this briefing are mainly for the uh, sector search. Uh, and I've <coughs> put up here these. Each one of these is in your is in your briefing paper, so you don't have to worry about copying. But the <coughs> initial flight planning is done on a, what was called a small area plotting sheet, and this is a, is a scaled down version of it, uh, although not scaled down very far. The sheets were oh, about a square, uh, and you just uh, tore them off of a pad and took them with you when you, when you, uh, when you left the ready room. Uh, some of the calculations that were done are represented in this second one. And they basically, what they are is they're uh, uh, wind triangle solutions based upon information furnished by the aerographer as to uh, winds aloft uh, at, the, at the altitude that the uh, uh, mission was going to fly, uh, or the nominal altitude. Uh, didn't always stay the same because uh, sometimes the, uh, the weather at the, at the altitude, the proposed altitude, uh, was not good enough, yeah. Uh, the difficulty of the mission would be complicated by the length of the flight. How long did the flights last? Uh, generally, four hours. That's, again, that's, that's a nominal figure. So two out and two back? Well, it's not two out and two back because you've got a base leg after you get out there that you go across. The flights out were about uh, let's say on average maybe 300 miles. Uh, the cross leg was probably 100 miles, and the return leg was uh, 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 the 325 miles, something like that, depending upon what the course of the ship was in the mean in the meantime. If the if the course of the ship was divergent, uh, then it was below the final leg was longer. If it was uh, uh, tending toward the sector that was being flown and it was a little bit shorter. Uh, none of that made an awful lot of difference and I'll explain that to you in a little bit. But uh, the uh, in, 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 uh, in planning for the uh, for these missions uh, important to understand the following constraints imposed on the pilots. As I said before, radio silence and wartime of that day was of paramount importance in order to protect the position of the carrier and to some extent the track of the flight. Low power transmitters such as today's, uh, similar to today's walkie talkies, allowed for some close range communication between planes of the flight so long as they were within two or three miles of each other. Um, and that was voice. 
anything else that I previously described, the various, the, the, two, the two signals, the uh, enemy sighting signals or the strike signals, uh, were done in Morse code. Uh, and uh, most pilots, whether or not they had a radio man uh, in the back seat, had a telegraph key strapped to their leg. And uh, you, had to, you had to be able to send and receive Morse code at 10 words a minute which is part of the criteria. And uh, so when you tap that stuff out, you had to do it generally a couple of times to be sure that uh, it was understood by the people on the other end. Uh, some of the aircraft carried uh, simple radio direction finders, uh, but the enemy was similarly observing radio silence, so they were often of little use except to obtain sometimes unreliable bearings from the shore station radio transmitters. Now, almost every island that was occupied either by us or by, or by the enemy uh, had some form of a radio transmitting, a transmitter on it. Uh, oftentimes, they were, uh, they were nothing more than standard broadcast stations uh, that broadcast news and uh, uh, other information to the occupants of the, or inhabitants of the island. Uh, but nonetheless, they were charted, their frequencies were known, and uh, they could be used to obtain radio bearings. However, they were of such low frequency that the bearings would, the, the signals would often bend, giving you a false indication of, of their direction. Uh, at night it was pretty good, but in the daytime they were they were often uh, often unreliable unless you were pretty close in. The uh, most of the shipboard aircraft of the day had a, a, a range corresponding to about six hours of fuel at lean crews, or approximately 65 percent of power. Uh, for the scout bombers, this equated to about. Uh, 900 no wind miles plus uh, 45 minute fuel reserve. Uh, 600 uh, I mean six hours of fuel is probably stretching it a little bit. Uh, if you didn't have any distractions uh, or any uh, significant changes of wind at, at altitude, and if you didn't run into any severe weather which caused you to deviate from the flight, flight plan, or you didn't run into any, any uh, enemy fighters or uh, uh, other uh, things that would cause you to deviate from the flight plan, uh, yeah, you probably could get six hours out of it, but uh, you wouldn't want to bet your life on it. Each squadron leader divided his part of the mission into as many fighters as were required to accomplish the objective, but no less than two aircraft per flight. Uh, fighters were sometimes requested to escort a scouting mission at least partway if enemy aircraft were likely to be encountered. Uh, they would usually fly high cover in order to enable them to uh, spot potential attackers and get in position to attack out of the sun. Uh, that means that uh, uh, if you attack out of the sun, anybody who's trying to draw a bead on them with a, with a gun would have trouble because they're looking into the sun to do it. Uh, not so bad with anti-aircraft fire from the ground, but uh, from pilots and other aircraft it was difficult. Okay, with that all in mind, the squadron leader with the assistant of other specialists proceeded to brief his pilots on the mission and each pilot was given his assignment that included the coordinates, latitude and longitude or radials of his search area, the current barometric pressure updated at the time of launch, scheduled time of launch and form up, that is air marshalling as we call it today, uh, instructions, preferred altitudes to be flown, weather forecasts including winds of loft, winds of loft information, more about that in a minute, uh, intelligence reports on activity within the search area, both enemy and friendly, uh, communications frequencies to be used for the mission, coordination with other elements of the air group, anticipated course speed and coordinates of the carrier at the time of launch, 
during the mission and at the expected time of return and a bingo or possible alternate landing fields such as a friendly island or other carrier. Now, <clears throat> winds aloft. Uh, you don't fly these missions on the deck. You, you fly them well up into the, into the sky. And uh, the winds aloft that are furnished to you by the uh, by the aerographer are largely based upon a weather balloon that he launches from the deck of the carrier. Okay, that tells you what it is right where you are. But 150 miles away, it could be significantly different. So, the, uh, 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 we'll get to what you do about that in a minute. Each pilot then phoned, uh, plotted all the coordinates or the radios from the carrier that encompassed his search area on a small area plotting sheet, and I pointed that out to you here. Each one of those represents a leg of the flight. Care they started the launch point of the carrier was here. Uh, the return point of the plane was where the carrier was expected to be uh, that many hours later. <clears throat> As I said, he, he then solved the, the relative motion and speed problems for all three legs of the flight with a, with a uh, what was called a Mark III plotting board. And that's a device that looks like this. I have to tell you, this is probably older than most of you. <laughs> uh, it has a movable disc here, which the graphics of which will allow you to transfer a course or a heading uh, from one bearing to another. Uh, the concentric circles in here called speed circles are uh, uh, used for measuring uh, uh, both speed and distance. Uh, the little calculators glued onto the thing to be able to solve some of the uh, time distance uh, problems and they're nothing more than a simple slide rule but they're graduated in uh, uh, increments that are, are usable for uh, uh, nautical miles, not statute miles, nautical miles, uh, for some correction for altitude and temperature uh, and so on. They're a pretty handy gadget and Sometimes you had to solve two problems at the same time, so you, I, I glued another one on here on the, on, the, on the top of the board. Okay, now, you, you obviously can understand the use of this in the, in the planning of the flight. Uh, but every one of the aircraft, or the large, at least the larger aircraft, the bombing planes, uh, and I don't recall whether there were any in the fighters or not. There may have been. But the instrument panel was split. Uh, the split occurred just over the top of the joystick. So that a tray was inserted between the upper and lower halves of the, of the instrument panel. You pull the tray out, and in the tray, voila, is one of these things glued to the bottom of the tray. So you didn't have to carry your own with you. You left it. You left it in the ready room. But this is what was often used when you had to make an alteration to the flight plan for one of the reasons that I described a couple of minutes ago. Uh, sometimes when things occurred so fast that you couldn't, you didn't have time to pull this out and and start plotting changes in heading and changes in course and so on. But with a knee board. Uh, you simply made a note of those things and about how long they lasted. You take a, took a look at the clock and said, okay, I've, I've, I've been off course now for seven minutes and uh, uh, at the speed that I've been traveling, it'll give me some indication of where I ought to be based upon, uh, based upon that time lapse. And so then you get this out and, and recalculate the heading that you had to fly in order to reach one of the preordained coordinates, such one of the, one of the turning points. Uh, either here or there. 
Then the calculation of the relative motion, which was the final leg, which was the important one for everybody in order to be able to get home, uh, was uh, simple geometry. And uh, anything you did prior to the time you made that final turn for the carrier uh, had to be accumulated and plotted on the board so that the return leg, which would be altered, uh, consistent with the, the, the amount of the deviation that had occurred up to that point, uh, that could be, uh, uh, could be f uh, forecast and, and plotted. Uh, you can see the importance of the calculation of that final leg. Now, it's, uh, if you want to pass this around, you take a look. Be careful, that's kind of brittle. The, um, after having gone through these two exercises, these calculations are transferred to the plotting chart. Uh, then I have some other things in this third graphic up here. The, uh, the upper the upper diagram is the standard wind, what's called a wind triangle, uh, and it's used for solving the, uh, the problems of uh, the difference between uh, uh, air, uh, indicated airspeed and ground speed. Uh, the, uh, the heading you have to fly to make good a certain course, uh, and then the lower portion of it is the part of the uh, uh, triangle that's used for calculating the relative motion between the carrier and the uh, uh, and the aircraft itself. The pilot proceeded to develop the geometry of the flight on the small area plotting sheet, uh, transferring all unnecessary information obtained from the plot uh, to his flight log. And his flight log is this, this final graphic over here on the side. Uh, this is all done before he even before he leaves the ready room. Uh, at the time of launch, he knew what the <coughs> compass headings were to fly on each leg and the number of minutes to fly on each heading uh, for a given indicated airspeed. Now, uh, again, uh, this is all done beforehand, and it's based upon the information that's furnished to him. If any part of that information is wrong. Uh, or it turns out to be wrong, uh, then he's got to make an adjustment after he, after he gets in the air, yeah. You mentioned that the flight might encompass two, four, or six aircraft. Would one be the lead navigator for it, or, or did you have six independent? I realize you could lose some. There was not, that, it seldom was formal. If it was, a, if it was a large strike, yeah, somebody would do, be designated as a lead navigator. But uh, as you'll see later on in this briefing, that most of those search flights were two plane, uh, two element groups, uh, two aircraft at a time, one, uh, one, one lead and one wingman. Uh, the thing that we usually did was that we, during the, the development of the flight plan, uh, we coordinated with each other to avoid uh, making fatal mistakes in the, in the navigation. And uh, by checking with each other, at that usually you, you, there weren't any any real gruesome mistakes that were made. So uh, there are a couple of compensating things here. One, and, and, I'll, and this is in the briefing, but the <clears throat> you have to remember that at, uh, let's say at six thousand feet of altitude. You can see for over 80 miles to the horizon. Now, you can't identify a ship at that distance, of course, but, but what you can see as you get a little bit closer, you can see wakes. And as if you, and it makes it possible even to start counting the wakes, wakes after you get a little bit closer. Uh, the difficulty with that is that you, uh, frequently have some sort of cloud cover during the mission. And in order to be able to see the distances that you 
would like to be able to see simply because of your altitude, you often had to get lower. You had to get down below the, below the cloud deck. And when you did that, then your sight distance to the horizon became shorter. Uh, the upside is that the carrier task groups, battle groups are called today, uh, consisted of as many as a dozen, 14 ships with the carrier at the center. The outrigging ships that were used for submarine protection and for uh, anti-aircraft protection by throwing up a you know a wall of fire were often as much as 50 miles away from the carrier itself. So you you. Uh, you often could see some of the ships out on the outer ring of the task group uh, a long time before you saw the carrier itself. And because of the way that they formed up, the steaming plant is they make it kind of like a concentric circles. And you knew that once you saw some of the outlying ships, uh, you could begin to figure out in your, you know, in your mind where, where that carrier is like to be and likely to be in, in relation to uh, uh, those outer rings, yeah. <clears throat> Frank, if, if on patrol you got into an extended combat situation, say 20, 30 minutes worth of fighting, at that point you don't, you no longer know where you are because you've been, you know, otherwise. Well, you're, you're, when you say 20 or 30 minutes, that's, well, that's, that's several lifetimes. <laughs> okay. well, so you wouldn't be that far off where you thought you were when you're done. No, but you're likely to be, you're likely to be some distance away, enough to, en enough to that, that if you didn't correct for it. Mm -hmm. The compounded area error that occur, had occurred up to the point of making the last, the final turn, right. could have been enough to throw you way off. Well, that's my question. Since you're no longer operating from a known position at the end of the combat, right? Stop and think about it. Right. In, in plane geometry, mm -hmm. it doesn't take much of an angle of difference between the intended course and the heading that you're actually flying. Oh, point taken. To, to wind up way apart when you get down oh, to 150 miles down right. the road. Right, but yeah. um, that's what I guess my question is, since you don't actually know where you are now, yeah. what do you use for a base of your calculation for the return leg? That's my question. Uh, you 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 make a correction based upon the notes that you've made of the deviation from the flight plan. And it's, yeah, it's a wild-ass guess, uh, frequently, but, uh, okay. but because, of the, because of the advantages that you have of being at altitude and so on, it generally didn't make all that much difference. It's not nearly as critical as it is in surface navigation. Right. Okay. When, when, when you're in combat and you're making all these turns, you're principally either evading or doing, you aren't noting I went 320 for two minutes and I went 180 for six minutes. No, like that. so you, you broaden that sphere at the beginning to return, don't you? Yeah, but you you, you got to understand that when you get involved in that kind of a, in that kind of a combat situation, the area in which all of this this uh, aer these aerobatics are being performed is really quite small. It's it's not large at all. So you can wind up about where you were. Yeah. You, you, often you could. Yeah. And it, you, so you're three or four miles off. Well, you're looking for a 50 uh, mile wide ring. You yeah. Go home too. Yeah. So that yeah. helps. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, when the order comes, uh, pilots man your planes, uh, and that's not just a movie term. That actually that was actually used. Uh, pilots and the air crews grabbed their gear, including the flight plans, plotting sheets, and such navigation equipment as they needed, and raced up the ladders to the flight deck. Some aircraft with slightly larger cockpits, I described all this before, they carried a, 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 their own plotting board. Uh, I, I was going to bring today a, a bubble octant, which is used for celestial navig aerial celestial navigation with the strap on the damn thing broke as I was lifting it out of the closet because it was rotted. And, uh, but the point that I wanted to make was, uh, those things were only used in the in the larger aircraft, mostly patrol bombers. We couldn't handle them in the cockpits of these smaller planes. And because of the fact that you had to hold the thing so steady in order to get a, a, a decent uh, shot at, uh, at the sun, usually, uh, 
you frequently would be so far off just from the bouncing around that they weren't they weren't worth trying to try to use. But uh, they were they were uh, a useful tool in long range uh, aerial navigation uh, used by some of these patrol bombers that flew long long Which were distances. The patrol bombers, what models? Uh, PBYs, PBMs, uh, PB2Ys. So all land, the, the all flying, land, all fly, land based. flying, flying boats. Yeah. No, they they were not land based necessarily. Yeah. They uh, they they generally they could land on the water, take off from the water. Uh, it would be handy to have them based someplace where they could had a ramp, they could pull them up out of the water in order to do maintenance on them. But uh, uh, they were they were pretty much a duck. Right. Yeah. Did you have a term for that aerial sextant? Did you call it some sort of octant? Called an octant. And the different yeah, the difference being that a sextant, if you you know what a sextant looks like, and you know it's got a curved arc at the at the bottom of it that's graduated in degrees. A sextant, that arc is a sixth of a circle. An octant it's an eighth of a circle. But it performs the same function. Thank you. Now uh, the octant has on it also something that the sextant doesn't. It has a device called a, a timer. Uh, the one that I have, the timer has long since been lost, but it gives you a way to to average out the sun shots that you get. You you got a you know so many degrees at x hour and minutes. Uh, you shoot it again and it varies a little bit. And you shoot it the third time, and it varies a little bit more. Well, this timer actually averages out the uh, averages out those shots. Uh, Is that like uh, a little sand clock timer? It's all enclosed. It's uh, I've never taken one apart, so I don't know what it looks like inside. But it's uh, uh, it's just a black box that's fastened to the right, to so the device. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's mechanical. Okay. Okay. Um, as I said, upon departures from the carrier, all navigation was performed by dead reckoning, which consists of deducing the position of the aircraft at any given time by keeping account of the direction and distance run over the surface of the Earth from the point of departure. Any fix of a DR position is accomplished by taking bearings on positively identified Earth landmarks or radio signals. Uh, anything else is no longer a fix. That's a that's a, a guess. Uh, <clears throat> the pilot carefully recorded his time of launch, time of departure from the form-up point, and time of arrival at cruising altitude. And the reason for that is that uh, your burn rates of fuel are different uh, up to that point in time. They are higher. Uh, once you get to cruising altitude, uh, your burn rate becomes what uh, whatever's on the card for uh, power settings. It'll tell you how many gallons per hour you're, uh, you're using. And you, you knew that before you left, so you, that was all in the calculation of the flight plan. The, uh, <clears throat> the greatest potential for error in uh, dead reckoning navigation over water is in the use of assumed wind at, at the altitudes to be flown. Accurate winds aloft information was frequently unavailable for the outer reaches of the flight. Significant changes to the assumed uh, wind at, alti at uh, flight altitude would affect not only the plane's ground speed, but also the track made good over the water. If the plane's heading was left uncorrected for these wind changes, each leg of the flight might magnify the error until on the final leg, if the error became sufficiently great, the pilot would not likely be where the plan said he, the carrier should be. The potential result was, of course, very high risk to the pilot, air crew, and aircraft. And I've already, we've already been through that. Uh, uh, if, you, if you get to the end of that third leg and the carrier is not there, or the task group is not there, uh, somebody's made a god-awful mistake. And so what do you do then? Uh, before my time in the fleet, you instituted what was called a square search. And uh, uh, that was you got over that point that you were supposed to be, you, you, didn't, you didn't find your, your, your ships. And so you began a ever-expanding 
square search like this. And how did you do that? Well, you, that, you remember I told you that you calculated that flight with 45 minute fuel reserve. And you could you could cover a lot of ground in 45 minutes with that square search technique. However, uh, those guys who crunched numbers and kept track of the statistics of pilots that were lost and so on uh, finally came up with a recommendation that that square search be stopped. And that if you got over the point of where you were supposed to be and you didn't see the ships, you simply orbited that position. And if you had to ditch, you, you ditched while you still had control of the airplane. Uh, had time to get the raft out and uh, and sit there and wait for somebody to pick you up. And they generally, they'd find you because they knew where you likely were on board the ship. So they knew where to look. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of stories about uh, the guys that uh, uh, spent 80 days in a raft, Eddie Rickenbacker and some of those folks, but not very few stories of the, about the guys that only spent a couple of days in a raft before somebody found them. How often did it, what percentage were lost or was it a very high rate? I have no idea. Uh, in, in, in absolute numbers, I don't, I don't know. Uh, there were there were enough to be notable, but not not enough to be critical. Uh, the, uh, sometimes it was deliberate, and it was done deliberately to uh, because uh, maybe you get jumped by by enemy fighters, and the last thing in the world you want to do is lead those fighters back to your ship. So you just fly off into the sunset. A couple of guys did that, and for what it's worth, got the Medal of Honor for it. But but uh, uh, takes a lot of guts to do that. Okay, uh, getting back to the the uh, variation in winds aloft. Uh, it's known that wind velocity increases and changes direction with increasing altitude uh, with some degree of predictability. The pilot can apply certain rules of thumb to estimate the wind at his flight altitude based on the surface wind direction and velocity. And a method often used to determine wind drift was the execution of a maneuver called a wind star. Uh, after flying 100 to 150 miles, the pilot would check his wind drift by executing a 60 degree turn to the right from his existing heading, then flying for three minutes while observing the directions of the ocean swells or uh, white caps through a drift site installed in the floor of the airplane. And the deck was just a glass window, but it had uh, uh, engravings on it for radials and uh, uh, the same kind of things that you would use for <clears throat> calculating wind drift on an E6B computer, this, this, part of the, this part of the computer. The, um, the drift site had grid lines and bearings line engraved on it so the line of swells or white caps could be measured as an angle to the plane's heading. The pilot noticed it, noted this drift angle, then turned left 120 degrees for another three minutes and repeated the observation. He then returned to his original heading and read the drift angle. And plotting the three observations, as shown here in the lower part of this diagram, you end up with the actual correction that has to be made in terms of wind direction and velocity. And you can, when you go through your your briefing paper, I think you probably can see how that works. Uh, if, uh, if that wind velocity and direction plotted from the wind star, uh, 
was different than the one shown in the flight plan, then you had to adjust the company, your compass heading to compensate for it and, uh, when you continued. And the pilot repeated this maneuver whenever by observation or instinct he felt that his drift was more or less than that necessary to achieve the planned track over the water. Now, <coughs> first of all, you can't do it at 6,000 feet uh, because you can't see well enough down to the surface. And so you generally have to get down pretty cl fairly close to the deck to get a good reading from the drift site in the, in the uh, uh, floor of the airplane. Uh, that meant that you had to use the, <clears throat> the rule of thumb for every thousand feet of altitude, the wind direction changes about 30 degrees and the velocity goes up by some number that I've now long since forgotten. Uh, as I said, this was 65 years ago and uh, flying a wind star I didn't do in later years, yeah. You mentioned you were flying in compass settings. Were these, in World War II, were they just magnetic compasses or did they have gyro compasses yet? We had uh, we had gyro compasses. Uh, there were three classes of compasses: the magnetic compass, which was probably the most unreliable right. thing. Uh, okay. Not only did it bounce around in the you know when you were flying, but but also there are a significant number of ore bodies in the floor of the ocean in the Pacific that frequently will 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 alter the reliability of the compass. Now, you know, you looked at charts and you see that there's those variation lines, yeah. magnetic variation lines that go through. Uh, that's nominal. You could be flying over one of those ore bodies uh, for a short distance and have it absolutely go crazy, the compass go nuts. And so the gyro compass became your savior after a while. But the gyro compass was not without its frailties. I mean, it, it, uh, you, you, had to, you had to reset the thing every opportunity that you got. And that meant when you could get a positive bearing on something, then you go went ahead and reset, and reset it. Uh, <clears throat> you had a wet compass too, didn't you? Well, that's what we're talking about. The magnetic compass is the, is the wet compass, and that's the, probably the most unreliable of, the, of everything that you had in the airplane. Even when they're working right, they're hard to fly. Yeah. It's all right for general direction, but yeah, for, 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 for the yeah. precise the precision yeah. required here. Yeah. And then did you say there was a third type yeah. of compass as well? Radio compass, ah. but that didn't come along until later. Uh, and the pilot would sometimes repeat this maneuver whenever by observation or by instinct, and it was more often by instinct. Uh, he felt that a drift was more or less than that was necessary to achieve the planned track over the water. Uh, didn't happen too often because you, you, you burned a lot of fuel going down looking at it and climbing back up again to, to a, a acceptable flight altitude. Uh, when he reached the limit of his outbound leg, which is here. <clears throat> the pilot recorded the time of the turn and recalculated his heading for the second leg if his previous wind stars indicated another wind velocity and direction than that used for the flight plan. It should be noted that in the vicinity of occupied islands it was frequently possible to take bearings on radio transmissions thus providing a, a dead reckoning fix from which the pilot's position could be confirmed and his heading adjusted if necessary to return to the planned course. And I described that to you later. And there's a, uh, I'm sure that you can run across documents that would give you the call letters for most of these island stations and the frequency that they, that they normally transmitted on. Uh, if the pilot ran into trouble because of enemy aircraft or some weather phenomenon such as a thunderstorm and was forced to significantly deviate from his flight plan, he recorded as much of the deviation as possible in terms of course speed and altitude changes and delay in, in time and route. And this information was utilized later in making adjustments to his headings and courses to recover his original flight plan of the final, fl uh, final leg of the, uh, of the search so that he could return to the carrier before uh, his remaining fuel became a problem. 
It should be noted that visual distance, well, I explained all that to you, the visual distance to the horizon increases with, with altitude. Uh, after July of 44, the coming of airborne radar installations in the larger shipboard aircraft, mainly the TBFs, TBMs, uh, enabled missions to be flown at night and provided additional navigation capability to other aircraft that formed up on these pathfinders. Other radio navigation aids were waiting in the wings at the close of World War II and were placed into service as soon as radio sil the radio silence room rule could be suspended. Further developments over the years have furnished today's carrier pilots with many magic black boxes, uh, but accurate navigation and its constant monitoring during the overwater flights remains as imperative for all pilots who face the problems associated with a landing field that is a moving platform and who wish to keep their feet dry. Uh, on the next page, I've kind of laid out for you a uh, uh, sample mission. Uh, gives you some idea of how the mission was developed, uh, what the pilot briefings are uh, consist of, uh, with actual numbers, and I think I've used those in the flight plan itself. That's where I got the numbers that are in there. Uh, Moon's Law, Intelligence, Communications. Yeah, okay. That, in general, is the is the course. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, radio silence. Mm -hmm. On your return, within a proximity of five or ten miles, was radio silence then broken as you coordinated your arrival? Not, 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 not by the pilot. It wasn't. But you, ships often had homing signals uh, that sometimes were not very good. Uh, uh, you, you know, something similar to an outer marker as you're approaching an airfield. But uh, you have to remember that a lot of this stuff is low frequency, and low frequency is is well, is it's a very powerful signal. <coughs> it's. Uh, <clears throat> it's encumbered by interference. Uh, there's a lot of <clears throat> cumuliform cloud activity in the South Pacific. And frequently those cumuliform clouds contain uh, electrostatic charges to them. <clears throat> and uh, lots of times you can't distinguish between an A and an N, for instance. Oh. I meant yeah, more so you calling up the ship as you fly back. No, no, you don't. You just no, come into a pattern, make a left break at everybody, in an echelon, and everybody yeah, lands? Yeah, yeah. So it's what, a kind of a gaggle then come in. Huh? Yeah, it's kind of, kind of a gaggle. But remember that everybody, if, if you're, you're flying uh, two-plane search units, not everybody gets back at the same time because the, the navigation for everybody is a little bit different. Uh, I, can't, I, I can't recall any more than four or six aircraft in a pattern at one time on as, a returning. As you returned and you got in the outer sphere, were you ever fired on by your own airship? I wasn't, but I'm sure there are people who were. Uh, that, that usually did not occur in the fleet. It frequently would, it would occur with shore batteries uh, if you were flying over your own territory and uh, uh, there were gun emplacements. You all day oftentimes would uh, get trigger happy and shoot at you. I remember one time in Okinawa, yeah. Were drift sites uh, installed on all aircraft? Uh, all of them that I knew, that I knew about, yeah. Uh, so the, the, the principle of, of the wind star is predicated that winds at the surface are constant, indicated by the wave at Well, I wouldn't say they're constant. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're indicated 
by the action of the swells. And of course, if there aren't any swells and there aren't any white caps, then you don't have a problem because you don't have any wind but in the surface. Swells and white caps often are coming from different directions. Uh, uh, generally, there's a there's a pattern to it that you can that's discernible. You you can't. Uh, uh, it's uh, usually it's enough to you can get you can get enough of a of a of, of a feel for it when you look at it that as to what direction a wind is blowing. It's yeah, th th there are breaks here and there where you'll get one cross cross swell or another one over here or something. But in the main, the white caps, the swell lines will all be in the same going in the same direction. What did you use for a rule of thumb? Or winds aloft as you increased altitude. For example, you had to come down to 2,000 feet or so to run a wind star. But if you're cruising, that gives you the wind yeah. at that level. But if you're cruising at five or 10,000 feet, how did you correlate that to when you climb back up to your cruise altitude? Well, I think I mentioned that that there, the rule of thumb really was that the direction in the northern hemisphere, the direction of the wind. Uh, changes about 30 degrees for each thousand feet of altitude up to some level that I don't remember. Uh, and how about velocity? And the velocity, the velocity increases as well by some increment. But you don't remember what. But I don't remember what it was. It's not a constant What's that? It's not a constant increment. No, it's yeah. not, constant, not constant. constant. You're taking your wind star 2,000 yeah. feet and then you climb back up. There's yeah. No, uh, you have no confidence that the wind at altitude is what it was at 2,000 feet. It's going to change. In oh, no. You, you, as a matter of fact, you know that it isn't going to be the same. Yeah. So my my yeah. question was, what, what's, what kind of rule of thumb or standard do you use to... If I remember the exact amounts, I'd, I'd yeah, tell you, but I don't. <clears throat> but I do, I do remember that the, the, for every 1,000 feet, it was yeah. about a 30 degree shift in direction right. to, uh, clockwise. And that depends on which hemisphere you're in, too. Yeah. Southern hemisphere is yeah. it goes right. that way. Yeah. <clears throat> the velocity is what I don't remember. Right. The velocity yeah, yeah, changed. Yeah. I, I was just curious if you did. Yeah. Would you go off? Would you be flying missions? I take in, forgive me, fairly nasty weather. I mean, like moderate rain or light rain or heavy rain. We tried to avoid it, Bruce, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, <clears throat> but simply because of the simply because of the nature of tropical weather, it wasn't possible to avoid it all the time. Uh, you did. You did know enough to avoid thunderstorms, but uh, and and oftentimes that was a that was an impediment to your planned navigation, because in order to circumvent some of those things, you had to deviate considerably from from what your flight plan was, and those are the kinds of things you had to keep track of. What aircraft were you flying? I flew an SBD dive bomber. But it uh, it really wasn't as complicated as it might have sounded, it, it, because a lot of it was uh, uh, approximation and uh, just based on your judgment, you know, that that kind of thing. With the patrol missions that went out, would they utilize SBDs for that, or would oh they? yeah, yeah. So if the patrols could be flown by the different aircraft. Of what was available that day, so you might send a fighters out and do it one time. You might send SBDs out. You might send torpedo runners. Well, they might. yeah, but they, they they seldom use the fighters for that because the fighters had a shorter range. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the larger aircraft, the, the bombers, the torpedo bombers, and the and the, and the uh, dive bombers had a had a pretty good range to them as long as you didn't have them load them up, loaded up with bombs. <clears throat> That extra weight made quite a bit of difference in fuel consumption. So, if you could find a task force on your way back, yeah. did you have any? Uh, what was the position of the carrier in that task force? Center. Would it always be in the. Always. In the, always be in the center. Yeah. Or if there are several carriers in the task force, <clears throat> would they be? Would they be within sight of each other? Oh well, occasionally there'll be more than one carrier in a task right. group. Okay. Uh, uh, not often, but occasionally there would be, uh, especially when there was a large attack mission going on. <clears throat> but the, uh, they still, they, and they would, the two carriers would have one ring of, of protective ships around the two carriers. Uh, so if then on the outer perimeter, you're pretty much assured of finding... You're going to find something to land on, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, but but as the task uh, group turned, those carriers wouldn't always stay in the same relative position to the, some of the ships uh, on the perimeter. Yeah, right? the ships on the perimeter, the ones, especially the ones on the outside of the turn, had to go like hell to try right. to maintain their yeah, station. Yeah, the way around right. the carrier yeah. turns, yeah. else has to follow, yeah. right? Uh, it still would stay enough. Uh, the pattern would remain for you to be able to recognize it. So you could, you could <coughs> yeah. Were there numbers painted on the flight deck? No. Mm -hmm. So how would you recognize two ships of the same class? Profile. Silhouettes. Right. But if they were both Essex class carriers, how would you differentiate at a distance? What would you look for? You wouldn't necessarily. You frequently landed on the wrong oh, carrier. Okay, that was <laughs> So that would happen yeah. with some frequency. Yeah. yeah. Was the carrier, with all these flights going on, was it always in a state of readiness during the daytime that it could receive airplanes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there was always an LSO there and they were always ready. So always, always ready. That was clear. Yeah. 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 They did. When you were coming back? We, it, it, if you got into a. Into a uh, fairly concentrated combat zone, you did not leave airplanes parked on the deck. You got them the hell out of there uh, until everybody was back. And then sometimes they'd start loading the flight deck uh, in advance of, of the next day's mission. Remember I said up until mid-1944 at any rate, well, they, they uh, most everything was done in daylight, and most flying. So with the deck six hour mission, would the ship be into the wind for six hours? No, no, they would, they would, they would turn into the wind once the returning aircraft were sighted. Okay. And they'd stay in the wind until all of them were back. Okay. Frank, if you had a large number of returning aircraft, was there any way to differentiate uh, if some crews were lo low on fuel and others weren't? Was there any way for the guy, for the people on the carrier, to know who had priority? Yeah, there was, uh, they, uh, aircraft frequently, the pilots frequently carried a device called an Aldus light. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 and it just flashed red or green, and, and uh, you, there were signals that you used okay. to. Okay, it was visual, okay, visual. Yeah. Okay. But it, uh, my recollection was it frequently was first come, first served, you know. <laughs> You see some of these movies of aircraft coming back that are shot up, and when they come back, they disable the carrier at that point for a little while. Did they hold those off so they could get the other ones back? Because if somebody came in and they couldn't get their gear down, or they could only get one gear down, they're going to tie up that deck for a while. Uh, priority yeah, to some extent there was, and it, but it largely depended upon uh, the, the, the first thing you knew, you knew which aircraft it was because it's got big numbers and letters painted on the side of it. You knew from the records in the, in, in, in well, there wasn't any such thing as primary flight control in those days except a couple of guys with a megaphone down on a catwalk. But somebody kept a record of when those planes departed to the hour and, and minute. So, and they knew how much fuel they had on board. So they could roughly estimate how much fuel they had left. Uh, if a plane was shot up badly enough, uh, frequently they would, uh, the, the pilot knew enough to try to ditch the aircraft alongside of the carrier. That was all his decision. Yeah. He wasn't commanded by radio, ditch it and we'll pick you up. Or no. He just did it. No, he just did it. And, and the days he, knew, he knew they'd pick him up if he could, if he could get out of the cockpit. And that would, that would be up to the, the uh, screening ships to pick him up, not the carrier yeah, itself, right? right. Yeah. We actually, you know, we lost surprisingly few. Uh, the numbers sound bad, but but compared to the the number of possibilities, it wasn't it really wasn't all that bad. The system worked pretty well. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Were you going to say something about Okinawa? Oh, in response to a question about did you did you suffer much from friendly fire? Uh, I do remember one time at Okinawa when uh, there was a uh, there was a Marine airfield on the top of a bluff overlooking not Buckner Bay but over on the other side Green Beach or 
whatever it was. And it was an Army anti-aircraft battery uh, stationed on the beach just below it. And these guys took off every morning, and every morning they got shot at by this anti-aircraft battery. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you want to shoot back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would, would you say a little bit more about what carrier just you flew off of and uh, what years, et cetera? I flew off the old Enterprise, old CB6, uh, uh, in, in the spring and summer of 1944. I was in, at Okinawa, I was assigned to another ship uh, with, a, with another duty. Uh, non non flying duty, and so I made the Okinawa invasion uh, on an ammunition ship, if you will. That's ballsy. Well, my mother said that. She said that uh, she was so glad I was out of the airplanes and on the right side of the same ship. You said you flew the, the, yes, the Dauntless. Yeah. Um, what's the success rate pretty good on the dive bombing of hitting targets? Hitting. Well, I don't know what you mean by pretty good. Uh, Accuracy. There were a lot of attacks that were near all near misses. Uh, we didn't 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 hit the target, but mm, distracted it enough that they deviated from whatever their current mission was. Uh, sometimes the the uh, the hits were were. Uh, not totally disabling, but did a lot of damage. Uh, I'd say we did actually, we did. If we had enough airplanes on the attack, yeah, we did pretty well. But sometimes if you only had two guys that had spotted one and decided to go down and, and dump on it, well, uh, sometimes you were lucky and sometimes you weren't. Was that because the archaic delivery system? Uh, or no, it largely had to do with the, with the anti-aircraft fire. You know, two airplanes for several ships to concentrate on is a lot different than, than a dozen airplanes for them to shoot at. Other things been equal. Is, are you more likely to get a hit coming from a stern or coming from like, in a broadside? You always came out of the sun when you could. Okay, so just, okay. So they could, the gunners couldn't see it. Oh, that makes sense. Were their gunners pretty good? Uh, some were. <laughs> they're, they're good enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I came home with holes in the airplane on more than one occasion. Yeah. My apologies since I missed the beginning of the briefing, but uh, can you comment at all on the training you received stateside before going out? Yeah, it was excellent. Uh, in the early days, there, there were, before my time in, in training, I would say in 42, uh, the training was short and probably not extensive enough. But as the, as the, uh, as the program began to wind up, uh, yeah, we had more schools. It lasted longer. We had more time in operational training. Uh, and I guess more importantly, we had an opportunity to, uh, uh, to work with some of the combat experienced pilots. So they'd work and that, back out. Yeah, and that, that made a big difference. I mean, it's one thing, you know, to, to go by the handbook, but it's another thing to uh, uh, to be taught by the guys that actually experienced it. And I, I would say that that probably was more important than any other part of the, any other part of the training. I mean, there was a level that you had to reach being able to fly an airplane. Uh, you, you had to reach the point where you and the airplane became a single entity. But uh, then what you did with it in order to stay out of trouble and to be successful with it largely depended upon uh, tactics that they didn't teach in flight school. If you came back and landed on the wrong, a different carrier, would you just overnight or would they gash you up and you'd ferry over to the other one? Depending upon what time of the day it was. Okay. Was it, uh, it? I mean, it happened all the time. And, it, and lots of times it was it was not because you mistook the carrier, it's because you were low on fuel and it needed a place to put down. 
totally considered acceptable. It wasn't. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, what was not acceptable is landing in the wrong direction. <laughs> Did that occur? Yeah, once or twice. <laughs> they didn't have to tell about it. They could see it occur. They couldn't see the wake. Yeah, yeah. No, there were there were strange things that happened under under you know uh, extreme circumstances. The uh, I, I guess the worst one was the night after the turkey shoot when all of us had been out three times that day and we'd run through three tankfuls of gas. And we were coming home after dark, and none of us had any night carrier landing experience or training. And uh, the guys were at the limit of their of their fuel, and uh, everybody looking for a place to to sit down. And uh, they mistook cruisers for carriers, and they plus there was the fatigue factor. Plus you had people that were shooting at you, so. <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah. And, 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 and the other, the other, <laughs> the other thing, you wise old guys have got to remember is that most of us were about twenty years old in those days, and and while we were pretty good at what we did, uh, we were we were not ready for that kind of stuff. Speaking so like so of night landings, are there, other than the LSO having like light, what do you have, lighted paddles or something? Yeah. And there was no other, there was no other visual aid for night landing, correct? Uh, or any, you know, any well, that particular night there was one visual aid that nobody ever expected. Well, and that's ships. what mm, Mark Mitcher said, turn on the lights, and he oh. lit, lit up the entire fleet. Oh, that's, yeah, I read about that. Yeah. Find our way back. Yeah. So they lit up the fleet, and did they light, have a center line on the carrier for you to come in on? I don't remember that. I, I, I remember seeing, I remember side lights. Going down, but I don't remember a center line. Wow. Uh, if you were going to ditch the airplane in the, in the uh, open ocean uh, and there was a significant swell running, what was the technique? Uh, Parallel to the swell? You tried to, yeah. Yeah, you tried. You, if the swells were. had uh, enough of a, a, a small frequency, low frequency. Uh, yeah, you tried to you tried to land between them. Okay, uh, so now if you were landing, you're trying to land next to the carrier, and the carrier was into the wind, the the swells would be perpendicular to the carrier's course, so it would be difficult, wouldn't it, to land parallel to the? Carrier? You you my understanding, I because I'd never had to try it, Tom. But what my understanding was that the that the. Uh, screen that the ship itself provided to the weather okay. uh, made it a little easier for you to sit down. In other words, the sea was really a little smoother uh, right right alongside of the carrier. I think the big thing was when you had to ditch the airplane, you had to be aware in your head of everything you had to do bang, 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 because what you needed to be able to do is you needed to be able to get out of that cockpit, get out of the shoulder harness, un unhook the, the chute, uh, get over the cockpit combing, down on the wing, get the raft out, and make sure that if you had a gunner in the back seat, he wasn't on the other side pulling the raft the other way, so that you, and that happened occasionally. Uh, because there was a there was a hatch back of his compartment back there where they where that stuff was stored, and uh, if one of you grabbed one side and the other one grabbed the other, well, he had a tug of war over trying to get it out. Uh, but the objective, of course, was to get out of there before the damn thing sank. How quick could they spin you when you said like at the Marianas Turkey shoot when you came back and then you go out again? 45 minutes thereabouts. Bombing and fuel. Yeah. And they rearm they re on the hangar deck, so it's down. Yeah, re no, the no, they rearmed on the flight deck. On the flight deck. Oh. Yeah. Rearmed and refueled on the flight deck. Okay. That's why that's why the center section was always kept clear, and the barriers, the barricades were were aft of the island. And the launch didn't start until you get to the forward end of the island.
What yeah. was the ratio of uh, catapult launches to deck launches, and what was the criteria for that? Uh, <clears throat> you're really asking the wrong guy. Uh, we had, in those days, we still had pretty low, on some of the older carriers, the ones that weren't new, we had pretty low-powered hydraulic cats. The one on the, the one that we had on the Enterprise was a retro, and it, it, it frequently didn't develop full power. So most of us avoided the damn thing like the plague. <laughs> uh, we could get off under our own power safer than, even, even though you'd, you seen the movies of them, they disappear over the over the bow. Well, you knew you were going to hit that cushion of air and struggle along until you get a little more speed and start to climb. Uh, but it was a hell of a lot safer than being dribbled off the end of the flight deck. Wow. Any, any good books that you can think of on the subject? I mean, any any books that you've read that you said, "Hey, that was like what I was doing." No. Nope. No, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure I know what you mean, Bruce. Any, any good re additional reading we can Oh, read? oh. Like Flyboys, <laughs> but Flyboys was more of, of prisoners of war. That, uh... Uh, if you can get the copy of the Big E by Stafford, which is kind of the uh, keystone work for that ship, and... Uh, uh, there was another one about the Yorktown, the name of which I don't remember now. Uh, but some of those were <coughs> were eyewitness stories. I have, <coughs> I have read one that's at the Livermore Library. I know James from Livermore called uh, Carrier Battles, I think it was. This was yeah. a couple of years since I've read that. Or, or World War II Carrier Battles. There's another one that I have, and it's, it's similar to that. Uh, he says, I can't remember the title of it now. It's a fairly recent publication, but it's it's a compendium of other stuff, you know, that's that's been written about actual events. It's kind of like, there's a book called uh, Blind Man's Bluff that if you've ever been wanting to know about submarines and especially reconnaissance of submarines, I hear that the guys hand them to their family and said, if you ever want to know what I did, read this book. <laughs> so, okay. Why the answer? All right, gentlemen. Thank, thank you, you very much for coming.